Good evening. Pleased to welcome all of you tonight to the uh, first Presidential University Lecture. And uh, I hope you had a chance to uh, visit with the posters, the students, and the, their poster exhibit. Uh, these students are from the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine and the Department of Animal Science. Uh, and their work is on animal and microbial gen genomics, uh, the theme of tonight's lecture. Uh, we have an exceptional speaker to begin this lecture series, distinguished professor Max Rothschild, one of the world's top scholars in animal genomics. And Provost Ben Allen will uh, introduce Professor Rothschild in a moment. This is a new lecture series which we have created uh, to showcase Iowa State's excellent faculty, but also to enrich and stimulate the intellectual environment for members of the university and surrounding communities. Uh, Iowa State truly has outstanding faculty who are world leaders in their disciplines, who are making breakthrough discoveries, and who are recognized around the world for their excellence and for their contributions to the advancement of knowledge. Uh, but as it often happens, that faculty excellence sometimes is not well recognized in their own backyard, at their home university, their home community. So one of the purposes of this lecture series is to showcase our outstanding faculty members. The other, as I said, is to enrich the intellectual life by having lectures on exciting topics that are at the frontiers of discovery uh, and the lectures aimed at a general audience and not too technical. The speakers for this lecture series and we'll probably have uh, one a semester, and uh, depending on how it succeeds, maybe move to two a semester, will be those Iowa State University faculty who are working at the cutting edge of their fields, who are leading the breakthroughs on exciting topics, and who are skilled at translating the technicalities of their work into a lecture for a general audience. Uh, we hope that these lectures will stimulate discussion on a variety of scientific, academic, and societal issues, and will enhance the learning environment for all of us. This lecture series is supported by the Miller Endowment, a fund established through the generosity of the late F. Wendell Miller for the express purpose of enhancing our learning environment. I also want to thank the University Committee on Lectures, funded by the government of the student body, and appreciate the work of Pat Miller and everyone on the committee. And finally, I want to thank the members of the Agriculture Student Council who helped host this evening. Again, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. And now I'd like to ask Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost Ben Allen to introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening. It is indeed a pleasure to have the task to introduce the speaker at the first Presidential University Lecture, Dr. Max Rothschild, Charles F. Curtis Distinguished Professor of Agriculture and Professor of Animal Science. I can think of no better person to serve as the inaugural lecturer in this new lecture series. Professor Rothschild is an internationally recognized leader in animal genetics whose research has been directed towards identifying genes controlling traits of great economic importance in the pig. He has made significant contributions in the research areas of gene mapping, identification of genes controlling growth, re reproduction and genetics of swine, and statistical methods to evaluate animals. He has presented papers in over 30 countries and has more than 195 referee publications and many more non-referee publications. His state and national awards and appointments to national societies and editorial boards are too numerous to mention. I was going to try to do that, but I would eat up too much of the time. But I do want to note that he is a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science. But what sets Max apart, I think, from many, is how passionate he is about the role that faculty can play in a land-grant university in serving the state and nation. His educational pedigree reflects his land-grant background and passion. He earned his BS, BS degree in animal science
from the University of California, Davis, his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and his PhD from Cornell University. In fact, Iowa State was able to recruit him, I think about 1980, from the University of Maryland, obviously another land-grant university, where we also tend to recruit presidents. <laughs> his research and outreach directly impacts the economic development of the state of Iowa. He's a dedicated teacher of undergraduate courses and a mentor to PhD students, master's students, and postdoctoral students, and also a mentor to many, many other faculty in his department and other departments. He's also an academic entrepreneur. He, along with Professor Susan Carpenter, created the Center for Integrated Animal Genomics, which was selected as a new presidential initiative here at Iowa State. He now serves as co-director of that center with Professor Carpenter. He is a world-class scientist with a commitment and a vision of how his research can be of value to society and to the economy. He was the 2002 Iowa Inventor of the Year. He has received two R&D awards from the R&D Magazine, which honors the nation's top technological production innovations. I could go on, but I think you're getting the picture. The University Lecture Series was designed, as President Joe mentioned, to highlight faculty excellence and learning, discovery, and engagement. Professor Rothschild was the logical choice to begin this lecture series. It is my pleasure to introduce a person who has contributed so much, not only to Iowa State University, but to the state and the nation through his research and teaching and engagement, Professor Rothschild. President Joffrey, uh, Provost Allen, fellow faculty, staff, and students, ladies and gentlemen. I want to uh, first thank uh, the President for your uh, kind invitation to speak tonight as a presidential lecturer and for the honor. It's quite an honor, and I'm sure many faculty are, are least as deserving or more deserving than I am of this award. So I hope uh, when I finish speaking tonight you think I still deserve it. <laughs> um, I also thank uh, Provost Allen for your kind remarks. Um, I've, I've always enjoyed my years here at Iowa State and hope tonight to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've done and some of the things that we're engaged in. I'm going to speak tonight, ladies and gentlemen, about the subject of genetics. And if anybody knows me very well, they know I've been interested in this subject since I was a uh, child, almost 45 years now. I'll be speaking, hopefully, to all of you tonight. Um, I know there's a hip to a hip. Uh, hip uh, to miss uh, next uh, across the way here and if you want to be put to sleep you can stay here and then go over there but <clears throat> in any case I'm going to speak uh, hopefully about genetics and I'm going to do it uh, with at a level that I hope will address everybody's interest tonight so laypersons faculty uh, students and hopefully you'll all get something out of the uh, of the uh, talk tonight I'm going to talk about the role of animal genetics and how it affects all of our lives, not just people that work with livestock. And I want to make that very clear. This is well beyond work with livestock. It involves all areas of animal and comparative uh, genetics and genomics. And in discussing this, I'm going to talk about the promise that's, that's available to all of us. And this uh, fits in with my title, uh, which it obviously is the reverse of the 16th century uh, uh, proverb that said you couldn't make a uh, silk purse out of a sow's ear. I'm going to make the case, I hope tonight, that in fact you can make a, uh, a silk purse out of a sow ear and using genomics to do that. <laughs> so I want to start off first. I don't have a really good feel for what everyone's background is in genetics. And so the easiest way to do that is to start kind of with a baseline slide defining genetics. And uh, hopefully uh, we're all at this level. Here's this poor dog saying to the cat, it's, it's genetic, my father was a dog, I'm a dog. So this is the baseline that I think most people understand about genetics. They understand the differences between species and understand that that's under genetic control. Now obviously we have to go a little beyond that point tonight and hopefully I won't lose anybody in the process. I want to uh, remind all of you that if you've taken a biology class sometime in the last 30 years, uh, that all of this should be familiar to you, in fact perhaps in the last 40 years. Uh, we all, um, all bodies are made up of cells, 
and the genetic material in these cells are chromosomes, and uh, the genetic material, of course, is DNA. And we know that DNA leads to amino acids, and those amino acids lead to proteins. And this is, in a rough sense, the basis for the entire talk. But what's of interest is not that DNA leads eventually to proteins, but that differences in DNA changes the traits of interest and has large effects on the things we do and the things we eat and, the thing, and our health and all kinds of things. And we'll get into that tonight. So let me start with a, uh, uh, some simple uh, definitions of genetics. First, it's the science of heredity. I think everybody uh, knows that. It involves the transmission of genetic information from one generation uh, to the next. We know that genetics involves the interactions of genes with each other and with the environment to produce phenotypes, or what we see, the different traits. So for someone like myself, genetics controls my brown eyes, my lack of hair, my height, my weight, and so on. And this is a very, these are very simple definitions of genetics. Now, more recently, the field of genomics has come about. And very simply put, genomics is the science of, of sequencing data. So this involves all the new techniques that are involved with uh, new gene, uh, discovery of new genes, of genetic mapping, of uh, new genetic technologies, and there's too many to mention tonight, but certainly things like, comp uh, uh, like bioinformatics, in informatics. It involves gene regulation, genome expression, and as the array at the uh, corner shows, it involves all the new technologies uh, involved with arrays and, and uh, gene chips. So just basically, we've talked about genetics and genomics, and this is some background for you. Uh, I think everybody in science, and I'm speaking to the students now, uh, I think everybody in science should have some heroes. And I had some, uh, some scientific heroes, and uh, uh, they are all involved in some form of genetics. And on your far left, uh, this uh, gentleman on the horse is Robert Bakewell. Robert Bakewell uh, lived in the 1700s in uh, England. He was con considered to be one of the master breeders. Almost all modern sheep and, and cattle breeds can derive from some of the work that he did in terms of selection and inbreeding. And he created these breeds that we all now see uh, just driving around uh, here in Iowa or any of the other states. I hope most of you who've taken a genetics class will recognize the second individual from the left in the top row. Uh, that's Mendel. He was a monk, and he was the first plant breeder. And I'm glad to see that, that Steve's here tonight to represent the Plant Science Institute. But this is the original plant uh, breeder, and he did his work with, with the garden peas. This, the third individual might not be very uh, familiar to people. He's sometimes forgotten in the history books, but Oswald Avery proved that DNA was the transforming uh, pr uh, principle involved in inheritance. And then the uh, picture on the far right in the upper row is perhaps the most famous of Watson and Crick looking at the structure of DNA. Now, I would ask people that are, call themselves geneticists in the, in the crowd to tell me if they all know the bottom three figures. I would hope you would. The first on the far left is Sir Ronald Fisher, who the F test is named for and who is one of the three pillars of modern, animal, uh, mon modern uh, genetics. The middle person is Dr. Sewell Wright, and the third person on the far right was uh, Jay Lush. All three of the, the, those individuals met on occasion here at Iowa State and helped shape animal genetics and helped to make animal genetics what it is at Iowa State, but also all around the world. Nearly everyone trained in animal breeding and genetics uh, for a 40-year period either came from Lush or one of his students. So since we like to think about pedigrees in this area, uh, Lush was in almost everyone's pedigree, and in fact, uh, I would be called a, a double grandson of Lush because both of my major professors were Lush students. All right, well, I want to move on now and talk first about, the first part of my talk is going to be about livestock uh, genetics. And I want to make a very clear case uh, tonight that animals play an incredibly important role throughout the world. And I'm going to start in, first in the developing world. And I want to make the point that a single animal a single cow in many countries in the world means the difference between economic survival and death. Because these animals produce not only meat and milk and fiber, but they produce a, a calf that's sold, and economic return comes from that. And there are many programs out there now to, in fact, give money primarily to women in these countries because the men seem to waste it. And the women buy, uh, buy a livestock, raise the livestock, take care of it, and generate income for their families. So animals play an incredible role in these countries. And therefore, anything we can do to improve livestock genetic 
imp uh, we can make livestock improvement through genetics is extremely important. Uh, we hear a lot about people don't need to eat so much meat. I'll come back to that a little later. It, it's not whether we need to eat meat or not. I'm not going to argue that. That's not the point here. The point is that in both the developed world and in the developing world, there's an enormous demand for meat. And if you look at these numbers here, and you look in the developed, there's somewhere in the neighborhood there of about a 15% increase is suggested from 1997 to the year 2020. And that comes about partly from uh, population growth, but in the developed world, we're not going to have a large population growth. We're going to have a modest population growth. But it also comes about from the fact that people, as their incomes go up, they want meat. In the developing world, this is even more clear. And so if we look in China or uh, Asia or Latin America, we're going to see large increases, partly due to the fact that population growth is growing so rapidly, but also because as incomes go up, there is a demand for meat. So if we think about the fa this fact, we have to come to grips with the fact of how we're going to produce more meat more efficiently to feed people. You can make a lot of arguments that you shouldn't be eating meat. I won't make those tonight. But, you, but, the, but the actual fact is there's a demand out there, and we need to do something to meet that demand. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to su sum it up, and I'm going to talk about these three points tonight. How do we improve the production of meat, milk, and fiber while minimizing environmental impacts? That's an extremely important problem here in Iowa and in the developed world. How do we reduce animal disease and improve animal welfare? And finally, how do we use animals as, model, as models not only to improve animal health, but also to improve human health? And I hope I'll touch on these points tonight. These are our challenges for animal genomics research. One of the things I'm going to do tonight is to try and illustrate some of my points by using covers of, of uh, magazines that I found. And the point I'm going to make is how do we get this done? And I think this National Geographic uh, 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 cover tells it very well. We can employ modern metho methods of molecular biology and molecular genetics to unlock the secrets of the animal genome. And we can do this by finding the secrets of the genes. So if you go back to that building block, we just have to discover what that DNA is all about. And I'll give some examples of that tonight. So for those of you who've often looked at a person or an animal and think of them as the black box, if you like, and ask the question, I wonder what they are genetically. Uh, what we're doing and what we can do with molecular genetics that we couldn't do with quantitative genetics or genetics in any sense some 30 years ago is we can take that black box and we can open it up and look inside and look at the DNA and determine how many genes there are, what are the size of the gene effects, and which genes are most important. So I'm going to make uh, uh, some examples tonight of how we've unlocked that and looked inside that black box. A lot of people ask, how difficult is it to find a gene? And so I'm, I'm going to try by analogy here to show you uh, how difficult it is to find a gene. And if you think of the Earth, as I have in this example, as the entire genome, then a chromosome, of which uh, we all have different numbers, uh, not all of us here, I hope, don't have different numbers. <laughs> Might be some trisomy in the crowd, but I hope not. Um, Different species have different numbers of chromosomes. We can think of a chromosome as, for instance, a country. The general location of the gene as uh, a state, and in this case, Iowa. The gene itself might be a city within the state. And the actual mutation causing the trait difference is actually a single address or a house in the city, uh, in a state, in a country, on the earth. So that's the analogy of how difficult it might be to find genes. Now, it used to be the proverbial uh, needle in the haystack, but now we have tools that make this at least reasonable. And certainly in many cases, we can find those genes. Not all of them, but many of the cases. Well, how do we get started? And what you see here on your far right is, a, is evidence of a uh, comparative genetic map. These are chromosomes here. There's a pig chromosome 1, and there are a number of human chromosomes that line up, big portions of those chromosomes line up with the uh, pig chromosome. They have the same genes, not necessarily in the exact same order, but chunks of them are very similar. And it's this comparative nature that we can make use of, and I'll come back to that. Well, first we have to have genes and markers, just like you have to have street addresses. You can't find anything without street addresses. You, and then from those, you develop maps. 
And they're not much different. A linkage map, a genetic linkage map, is not much different than unfolding a map of Iowa. There's roads, there's exit signs, or anonymous markers are just like the uh, mileage markers on the road. These are on the similar in gene maps. We have to create trait maps. It's important to know, for instance, that in chromosome 1, if I get the pointer here, right up here, there's a very important gene that affects litter size. That's a trait map. Now, first I have to map the region, and then I can actually map the gene, and I do that with what's called fine mapping. And eventually, what I do is I develop a trait test, some way to take DNA from an animal, it may be nothing more than pulling a hair out and getting the hair root, and using that uh, DNA, uh, getting the DNA from the hair root, determining whether the pig or the cow or the chicken or the dog has the favorable form of the gene and selecting that animal. I want to make a point here. You hear a lot nowadays about genetically modified organisms. None of what I'm talking about today is genetic modification. It's use of traditional methods of selection using genes that, I, that, that myself and others uh, have discovered. Now, if we look at the estimated gene maps that, that exist in the different species, uh, in the pig, we have about 5,000 genetic markers. Uh, my colleague Chris Tug and I are responsible for a large number of them. Uh, certainly in the early map, when there were only uh, just over 1,000, uh, we had put on uh, over, well over 100 of those markers. Now they're kind of flying on the map a lot faster. But uh, in the cow, about 5,000. Uh, in other species, somewhat less. If you compare that to the human map, in which there's a complete sequence, of course, that's all 35,000 genes, and then there's about 100,000 markers that are available for linkage work. Now, there are several ways to find the genes, and uh, that would be a lecture in itself, and I'm not planning to do that. It's more technical than anyone needs. I'm going to make a case, I hope today, uh, to try and explain two methods. And I'm, using, I'm explaining these two because these are two that I've used in my laboratory, but also because I think they appeal to people. I think most of us can understand rather easily what they're about. And the first is what's called a candidate gene search, and the second uh, is called a genome scan project. You can think of that as a pedigree analysis. And there are other methods, uh, certainly some of the more elegant new ones involve expression studies. And many faculty on this campus are doing that uh, thanks to some great efforts of uh, putting up uh, uh, expression laboratory that's in the new building that, uh, that the Plant Science Institute houses. So there's certainly some very nice uh, facilities available to do that type of work. I want to start with candidate genes. And here I've taken a cover from Scientific American. And if you, can read that in the, if you can't read that in the back, it says muscles and genes. Candidate genes, by definition, are those believed to be involved in a physiological process. And I'll give an example. If I tell you growth hormone gene, the first thing you would think about is that it's involved with growth hormone, and hence it ought to be involved in growth. So that's a biological candidate gene. That's the easiest one I could mention. Uh, I'll give you a couple more in, in a few minutes. The second type of candidate genes are what we call mutational candidates. Uh, people have been doing animal breeding and genetics work with laboratory animals since the early 1900s, and with Drosophila and other species, and these, uh, this work has revealed a large number of mutations. We now know where those mutations reside in certain genes. And we can ask the question, does a mutation in the mouse for a particular gene, is there a similar mutation in the pig or the cow or the dog that would then predict a function of that gene? And that's a mutational candidate. And then finally, once we do some mapping, we can, do what's, we can find what's called comparative positional candidates. And that goes back to that slide that I showed you earlier that parts of the human chromosomes line up with other species. So I'm going to uh, today give some examples of these candidate genes, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. And I want to first talk about estrogen. I see there's a large number of women in, in the crowd. Of course, you all know what estrogen is, and hopefully all the men in the audience know what estrogen does also. This is a cover from Time from a few years ago, but it, the bottom here says, Every Woman's Dilemma. So estrogen is the primary female hormone for mammals. It's involved in all reproductive functions, embryo survival, fetal development, fertility, secondary sexual characteristics. It's extremely important. Now, I know you're thinking, he's going to say he looked at the estrogen gene. No, that's not the case. What I was interested in, in fact, was the estrogen receptor gene. And uh, this, I got this idea from speaking with Carol Jacobson, who used to be on the faculty, 
in veterinary medicine. And I got, I got this idea about pathways and trying to choose uh, points in which, would be more, which genes would be more crucial. And I hypothesized, and our lab has made use of this uh, over time, that in fact receptors which catch the hormones essentially, you could think of them as a catcher's glove, the hormone comes along, they bind with the, uh, with the receptor, that the receptors, if there's genetic differences in the receptors, they would be extremely important. And at that time, uh, we didn't have the pig gene. We used the human estrogen receptor gene. We used some pretty old-fashioned methods. And we pulled out the genetic difference in the pig. And we, in fact, got this. Uh, we now made a PCR RFLP test. And this is the first one I'm going to show you. So I'm just going to take a minute so everybody sees what these tests look like. As you can see, there are a, the possibility of three bands. These are genotypes. If you have just the upper band, this is, could be called a 1-1 one, one or an AA. In this case, we called it AA. We've modernized things. We now use numbers instead of letters. If you see just the lower two bands right there, uh, that's an animal that's BB. And then if you see an animal like this one right here in the center that has three bands, that's an AB. So this is how we can genotype animals rather quickly with what's called a uh, PCR test. And when we did this with Chinese pigs, we immediately saw a large difference for litter size. I have to admit, we were incredibly lucky. And we did this by looking at Chinese pigs. And this is one of the other things that I wanted to, to bring up to students. It's not enough to have a good idea. You have to have good subjects. And <clears throat> I don't know how many people around here know what a pig looks like. They, don't, they aren't used to seeing Chinese sows very often. This is a Meishan sow from mainland China. And thanks to the Iowa pork pork producers in the state of Iowa and the experiment station and a whole host of people, we were able to get money, go to China in 1989, and import these animals here. Now, why import these animals? Well, the average a U.S. Uh, pig has anywhere from 10 to 12 piglets every time she has a litter. The Chinese sows have an average two to four more pigs per litter. But on occasion, they have anywhere from 30 to 45 pigs per litter. Now, that's a lot of piglets. That's four That's uh, four times the mean, if you like. And with that, the, we raised the question, is there a genetic difference here? Of course we assume there must be. And so we took that estrogen receptor gene and we looked in Chinese pigs, and what we found, and this is one of the few tables that I have in, in uh, my talk tonight, but if you look at the three genotypes, AA, AB, and BB, and this is first litter or first parity, total number of pigs born and number born alive, if you compare the AAs with the BBs, you'll see that it's about 2.3 pigs more per litter, or over 20% of the mean increase from one genotype. Now, the first time I saw this, I thought, boy, this is too good to be true, because we only looked at uh, something like uh, uh, 19 pigs. And then I went and I got another big set like this, and it kept repeating and repeating, always uh, over two pigs per litter between the genotypes. Now, if you think back to that Chinese pig, she's not very good for a lot of other things. She doesn't grow fast. She's pretty fat. She's not, pretty, not very productive. So we asked the question, does this genotype exist in domestic pigs? And in fact, it does. The differences are not as great. This is for over 5,000 commercial animals that were tested. Uh, the previous work was from a paper in PNAS, and this is from some work in animal science. But the difference now is only about almost 9 tenths of a pig per litter. So this points to two important things. One, the effect of the estrogen receptor gene is still significant. It's a large difference. We don't want a lot of extra pigs. We just want a few more pigs. So on average, about 8 tenths of a pig per litter is quite good. The second thing it points out to is that one gene functions differently in gen different genetic backgrounds. And speaking to the students now, I would say the whole field of genetics is wide open to study gene interaction. This is going to be the most exciting area in the future. And uh, certainly, if you look at some of these different gene effects and different backgrounds, it's very exciting. If you look at number born alive, the effect is, is, is about the same. Now, I wrote here in red to get the message across. If I just normally select the best females, the daughters from the best females to produce the next litter, and so on and so forth, uh, I'm not going to do a very good job because it's not very heritable. But if I use this genetic test, I can make five times the progress that I could have by standard selection methods. So one genetic test, five times as great a progress. And I think this revolutionizes how we think about using, uh, how we think about uh, genetics and improving litter size. It has an added benefit. I could never select males for litter size. They don't produce litters. 
But now I can go in and genotype the boars, the males, and I can choose those that have the right genotype because they'll produce the daughters that are so useful in my herd. This, uh, this was a pretty big finding uh, from my laboratory, and it was commercialized. It's used by Pig Improvement Company, and they're now selling it worldwide. And in fact, uh, even though there were some problems early on with some exclusivity, they're in fact now trying to sell it uh, uh, worldwide to as many different customers as possible. And that's, that's moving forward. So this is uh, something about one candidate gene, and this is a biological candidate. I now want to talk about a mutational candidate. And I hope you can see, maybe on the people on, on my right can't as well, but there's two uh, mice in this picture, not one rat and one mouse. And that one mouse wasn't stepped on to make him look twice as big. Uh, in fact, he just has an eating disorder. And he has an eating disorder because he has a mutation in this gene called MC4R, a melanocortin-4 receptor. This receptor resides in the brain, it's one, and the gene that's, uh, that uh, codes for it, uh, <coughs> the receptor tells the animal, eat, don't eat. So it's extremely important. It's in the leptin pathway that many people have heard a lot about leptin and obesity. Now, I had, a, uh, I had a very bright graduate student, Kwon Suk Kim, who was uh, working in this area. He was quite interested in obesity and, and fatness in pigs. He saw this work and he said very simply, I wonder if there is a mutation in the pig, obviously not one that doubles the size of the pig, but it has some difference that's statistically important and biologically important. And so, in fact, we looked at this pig and he, he immediately found a mutation in a very well-conserved area. And now after some very tough work, we now show that this is a functional mutation. It's in the seventh uh, 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 trans domain. And you can see the different genotypes here. Uh, for those people on, on the right side of the screen, you can see that. But it's very easy to genotype. And if I compare the animals, the lean genotype with the fast-growing fat genotype, the lean ones have one millimeter less back fat. That's significant. They, uh, they eat 0.17 kilograms of feed uh, per day less. They're more feed efficient. In other words, they convert the feed to lean uh, instead of fat. They, in fact, uh, take a few more days to market. That's a negative. There's no doubt about that. But they do it more efficiently, so it's not a big problem. And this benefits the producer because it produces a leaner carcass, uses less feed. It benefits the consumer because it produces a leaner product. And we can go a step further. I said that we need to be selecting uh, and look, doing work that improves efficiency. Well, most of the time when we improve growth rate or feed intake, we're just changing appetite. And that's what we're doing here. But if we choose the right genotype, the animal eats less, uses it better, and produces, as you might guess, less waste. And I think most of us have driven someplace in Iowa and smelled pigs on occasion. And uh, even though everyone tells us that's the smell of money, sometimes we don't think money smells that well. So, this is an example, in fact, of a gene in which if you use the one genotype, it produced less, less waste. In fact, in a sire's lifetime, a sire that might be used in AI, uh, he might have 6,000 uh, progeny. They'll use 28 tons less feed and produce 33,000 less gallons of manure. So it has a real benefit to the environment. And if you think about per 10,000 sows, you could be talking in a neighborhood of over a million gallons, fewer gallons of manure that are produced. So this is the type of genes that we're interested in finding, those that improve not only pr uh, work for the producer, but also for the consumer. Uh, I've talked a lot about things related to uh, producers. Now I want to talk about what we eat, because I'm in the business of livestock genetics, and we produce animals for food. And uh, this poor fellow uh, is a little bit like myself, except he has a full head of hair. And uh, he's asking all these questions. Is the food safe? Uh, is, is it the right kind of cholesterol for me? Uh, should I be on the Atkins diet? I'd ask, how many of you are on that? How many have tried the Atkins diet? Nobody's, I have, I'll be honest about it. It works. And now everybody who's in is in the South Beach diet. You gave up on Atkins and you're doing South Beach now. And if you don't believe any of that, you say uh, high carbs, low protein. So we all think about that. But when it's all said and done, we want to eat food that tastes good. And this is a quote from Betsy Holden from Kraft Foods. Americans apparently in the modern age want two things. They want it on the table quick and they want it to taste good. And now they're starting to worry about whether it's healthy. Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to argue this diet thing because we, we have certainly done our share of the right thing in pig production. Pigs are incredibly leaner, a lot less fat than they used to be. Uh, but in doing so, we lost some of the taste. 
And now, at least in my lab and in other laboratories around the world, people are looking at genes that improve meat quality. And meat quality uh, is just nothing more than uh, looking at muscle and making sure after the animal is sacrificed that the muscle changes to meat in a way that the meat is tasty and tender and has, and these are all associated with a lot of biochemical properties. So I'm not going to go into that. I'm not a meat scientist or a biochemist, but my lab group is quite interested in finding genes that affect meat quality. And to do that, we've done what's called a genome scan. Now, I, I show you this, and I hope the diagram's not too confusing, but I want you to think for a second of what you've heard in your own families. If you, if you sit and you listen to your mother or your father or your grandparent, they might say, well, you got those brown eyes through your father and so on. And what, they, what they've done or what is the same thing that we've done. You've traced in your own families uh, traits that have been inherited across generations. So as animal breeders, and in this case pigs, we were able to set up, and this is a project that Jack Deckers and I and a number of other faculty uh, in the department worked on, we set up a large three-generation family by crossing Berkshire pigs with Yorkshire pigs on the far end and creating first the, parent, the, the grandparental, then the parental, and then the grand offspring. And we followed the traits, which ones were the fattest, were those correlated with different ge genetic markers. So we put genetic markers all across the genome, and this is what's called the genome scan. And in doing so, we created this, what we call a trait map. Now, I don't expect you to read all this. What you should get out of that is that <clears throat> this is a, a cartoon. Each one of these numbers here represent one of the pig's chromosomes. And in the case of the pig, they have 18 autosomes and, and sex chromosome. And uh, in fact, each one of these crosshatches represents where we believe a trait for growth or meat quality or back fat exists. And that's just a region. We don't know the exact gene itself. So the first thing we have to do is find the genes. And that's a long process, too long for this discussion tonight. But in fact, I circled two areas that uh, one of my postdocs worked on, one on chromosome 2 associated with tenderness, and one on chromosome 15 associated with pH. The pH, or the acidity of the meat, affects the water holding capacity, affects the tenderness, and affects the, quality, the eating quality. And uh, Dan Chibano, who was, uh, left my lab just last year, uh, who did a fantastic job, discovered actually the causative mutations in two genes, PRKA gamma 3 and CAST or calpostatin as it's known. And these affected pH, the acidity of the meat, and affected the moisture that the meat held. So what was the outcome of this for the consumer here? Uh, well, if you, ate, if you eat pork chops, uh, it, what it means is the appearance is redder, it has a nicer, uh, more even color. It's certainly more tender. It has better aroma, better juiciness, and better flavor. So this is an example of using molecular genetics to find these genes. And in fact, uh, these two gene tests are also being developed and commercialized, just like MC4R and the estrogen receptor. Now, I want to finish up talking about agriculture and, and uh, uh, its influence and, and how efficient agriculture gives people uh, richer lives. Now, if you just take that toast off that plate, that would be the perfect Atkins breakfast. <laughs> Pl plenty of protein there. And if you wanted 10 million of those, and there are a lot of people on the Atkins diet, I don't know if it's 10 million now, but it would require approximately 5,000 acres of crops to feed those animals. In the 1950s, 50 years ago, those 10 million breakfasts would have taken three times as many acres. So you hear a lot about agriculture ruining, ruining the environment. In fact, modern efficient agriculture not those people that ruin it for the others, but modern efficient agriculture improves things. It allows us more land for houses, more land for recreation. And in developing countries, it also allows, not the, uh, it allows us to prohibit uh, defor rainforest deforestation. So these are really some big benefits that are out there. I want to switch subjects now and talk about the middle part of my talk. And I want to talk about companion animals. And I guess if I could get people to raise their hands, everybody seems quite... Uh, uptight tonight, even more than me. Um, <clears throat> I think most of you, if I asked you if you had a pet, a dog or a cat, I bet two-thirds of you would raise your hands. Is that right? How many of you have dogs or cats? Great, great. And, uh, you know, dogs and cats were among the first animals domesticated. Chickens and pigs were also among the first animals domesticated. And the different breeds that we have, most people, a lot of people have purebred animals, not everybody, but most. And those purebred animals, the breeding was developed 
over hundreds of years of inbreeding, in other words, mating animals that were related to each other, to get a certain form. And that's why all uh, certain dogs of certain breeds look one way, and they look quite different. If you look at the dogs, you can go from Chihuahua all the way up to, uh, to the wolfhounds. Enormous difference. That's all from the same original animal, if you like. And this is done by inbreeding and selection. But unfortunately, in doing so, they've just trapped all those genetic errors that existed, the genetic load, if you like, and these are all diseases now that exist in these animals. And many of the breeds are plagued by very serious problems. So animal genomics offers opportunities to improve companion animal health. It also offers the opportunity, because many of these diseases are similar to what we have in humans, that these animals can serve as models for, uh, uh, for human health. And I have a long list uh, here of both cat and dog diseases. It's a partial list. Uh, this is courtesy of Dr. Leslie Lyons from the University of California and Dr. Uh, Matthew Ellenwood from the University of Nantes. Matthew's here today. We're hoping to attract him to come to Iowa State permanently. And uh, I, I thank you, Matthew, for your help on this. So there are a large number of these diseases that we could be studying. And in fact, one of the examples is one that, I, that Matthew has uh, kindly uh, shared with me. And this is a uh, human uh, mucopolysaccharide disease. In humans, it's uh, a central nervous condition. It's a lysozyme storage disease. It's involved with, uh, it stops normal development. Uh, after a few years, it's followed by profound mental deterioration and behavioral difficulties, and of course, shortened lifespan. <clears throat> the dog, in this case, the skipper key, and I hope we're gonna have a whole uh, group of these uh, here at Iowa State. This. Uh, serves as an excellent model to study this disorder and to study ways to treat this disorder. So we can use the dog here because it has the same disease. We can study that, look at the genetic differences, and look to develop therapies that can eventually be used in humans. And this is extremely exciting. And there are many animal models out there. In my laboratory, we're working on uh, looking for a genetic cause for cruciate ligament disorder, which uh, is important in some breeds of dogs. So there are lots of dog models out there that have application in, in, to uh, humans. And in, in doing so, I want to talk now about human health to, to, to give the uh, third example of why animal genomics is important. And I use human health, and here's a cover from Science Magazine. And unfortunately, you probably can't see the parts of the puzzle, what's written on this uh, cover, but it says diet, genes, viruses, and then it has other environmental things like smoking, pollution. So these all play some role in human disease. But at the top there, genetics. So we can think of using animal genetics and genomics to look at human health. And to do that, again, we're going to fall back on uh, what I think is this the greatest thing, and that's comparative approaches. And so in the center of this diagram, you can see a, 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 a cartoon of a human, a mouse, and a pig, my, my favorite, the Chinese pig. And we can use different methods in these different, spe in these different species to unlock some of the differences that we're interested in. In mouse work, we can start to use some of the techniques of mutagenesis to create different mutants and see how those mutations affect genes and then traits, and then use that information to look at functional genomics and use it to predict uh, therapies for humans. In humans, we can do association studies. If you have a certain genetic background, or you're more prone to a certain disease. But in pigs, as in other uh, other animals, we can set up breeding experiments, just like the one I showed you earlier. And we can breed those animals. It's a little tough to set up breeding experiments in humans. But we can use breeding experiments in pigs, and we can use those breeding experiments to design ways to unlock the genetic differences. Now, one of the uh, human health problems that I think everybody's heard about, that in fact has an animal model, is, uh, is the problem of HIV and AIDS. Uh, it's pretty well known that there's over 20 million deaths in the last 20 years. There's approximately 5 million new infections uh, just two years ago. It's over 14 million orphans worldwide. This is an enormous disruption of education and economic development, and it threatens global security. And if you really think about one continent, Africa, it's incredibly, incredibly devastating. In the developed world, primarily where the expensive therapies are being de developed, there's one called HAART, Highly Active Antiretroviral Therapy. This is effective because it reduces the virus load, but there's still reservoirs of the virus persist. Now, Susan Carpenter, who uh, 
serves as the co-director for the Center for Integrated Animal Genomics, is quite interested in this, and she's been looking at the horse as an animal model to study AIDS. And so she's working with a disease called equine infectious anemia virus. It's reportable. The USDA regulates the disease, it's regulated disease of horses. It's genetically and antigenically related to HIV. We can use genomic tools to investigate it, and that's what she's do she and her students are doing. And the role of genetic variation in virus persistence can be studied and immune invasion. So we can look at genetic differences in the horse, and we can see how that affects these things. And eventually, what she hopes to do with her work and the work of others in this area is to improve strategies for antiviral therapies and for vaccine design. So again, animals serve as models for human health. I keep coming back to this obesity thing. Maybe because, as, as one of my colleagues told me, Max, you're always on a diet. And he, and he was right. I am. I just forget the, to, to pay attention to it. Um, but most Americans, uh, I don't know if you've been watching lately, but there's a rather... Uh, damaging commercial against lawyers almost on every night now that talks about where the lawyer is, uh, has this poor young lady from the Girl Scouts on trial for selling cookies and, she's, and he's accusing her of creating obesity problems. Well, obesity certainly is associated with environmental factors like cookies and other things that we probably shouldn't eat, but it's also associated with different genetics and we can look all around the room and we can see different people and we can make assumptions that some of it is genetic and that's true, some might be, but also some of it is environmental. Animal models can help us pull those things apart. And again, if you look down on the 